Almost every day we see similar headlines. Birth rates decline, labor shortages worsen. But some experts believe there is no labor shortage in the U.S., just a shortage of decent jobs paying a living wage. And that is why millions of Americans are out of work long term. Even though they are unemployed, their numbers are not reflected in the way the government measures the unemployment rate. So who are the long-term unemployed? How did they become unemployed? And why is the number of Americans of working age who have given up looking for work at or near historic highs? I'm Bonnie Urbay, and that's the subject of this To the Contrary special report. Is there a labor shortage? The people at the bottom are just getting worse off all the time. I was just driven out. There's no path to moving forward. Elwood Davis has a great education. He worked for some of the country's largest corporations, designing massive communication systems. In shorthand, he was an IT executive. I was involved in a lot of the development of using uh, web development for uh, communications within a company and also for the development of selling products, not just marketing, but selling products over the internet. I was just driven out. You know, I just didn't fit in the direction they were going, and I've noticed that they spend l no time training and keeping American workers up with the latest things. There's no path to moving forward. I mean, there's just a, a, a cap on where you can go. Davis says he and many other executive IT workers were driven out of the industry a decade or more ago by the H-1B visa program used by the giants of the computer industry to bring in hundreds of thousands of IT workers with much less training, but who would work for lower salaries. Davis says most of the immigrants replacing top IT executives come from parts of Asia. American companies preferred hiring people from other countries, he says, because they were able to exploit them economically. Because uh, they can treat them different, they can hold the opportunity of getting a green card over their head, they can be relatively abusive toward them, overworking them, long hours, no life, and uh, that becomes a culture, and I saw that culture developing as they were pushing me out the door. What about pay? Pay is, is lower, and the thing that's sad is they're not just entry-level workers, they work them up until they're in management upper management and decision-making capabilities. Of course, there are many reasons for higher long-term unemployment, and immigration is just one. The most important factor is the strength of the economy, but the addition of more people to the workforce is the reason least understood by the public, and it's why most people have no idea how many able-bodied people of working age are not participating in the labor force. The monthly long-term unemployment figure from the Labor Department underplays the number of people on the sidelines due to the way it measures unemployment. The labor force is made up of all Americans between 16 and 64 years old who are fully able-bodied. Many in this very large group do not show up as unemployed for one very arbitrary reason. Why? To be considered unemployed, a person must tell the government they've job hunted in the last four weeks. If not, they don't count. It is really important for everybody who's looking at it, especially communicators, the media, and, and perhaps opposition politicians, to point out that there, there are a lot of other things that we need to measure other than just the unemployment rate for people who looked for a job last month. And of course, one of the things we need to measure is how we're we doing in terms of income inequality. Because you can have full employment, but maybe, maybe all the gains in, in wages are going to people at the top, and the people at the bottom are just getting worse off all the time. And that's kind of what's been happening uh, through, through the years. 
if you look five weeks ago, you just drop out of the numerator and denominator and you're not considered uh, unemployed. If you've given up looking for a job, you're not considered unemployed. And what we see in the United States is um, continually high rates of unemployment, of, of rates of uh, people not in the labor force at all. So they don't even show up in any unemployment statistic. Very roughly, if we looked at people, say, without a college education, especially those without a, with just a high school education, it used to be the case that at any given moment, 75%, three-fourths, very roughly, were in the labor market. Now it's more like two-thirds, again, very roughly. And that hasn't improved really significantly in the last few years. There's all these people, uh, put it this way, of working age, say 18 to 64, who don't work and say they're not even looking for work. And they're not in prison, they're not in the military. When we look at just people who are not in institutions of any kind, um, there's just millions or tens of millions of them uh, who in the past, it seems, would have been working or at least looking for a job are just totally out of it. U.S. Representative Pramila Jayapal was born in India. She worked as an immigration activist and is the first Asian American member of Congress from Washington State. This is one of the things I think that sometimes is introduced to try to pit people against others. But to me, they are, um, they are all issues that we have to work on collectively. So we do have to make sure that we are providing jobs and training and education for everybody in the United States, including those who were born in this country. Um, and so that has been a priority for me. It's why I work on a $15 minimum wage. It's why I work on you know, the idea of free college or higher education for everybody, um, regardless of income. Um, it's why I believe in apprenticeship programs. We have to make sure we're addressing those needs of our, of our population. But there's a very different view from some who are out in the field trying to help legal immigrants and native-born Americans stay employed in decent-paying jobs. But when we have this huge influx of undocumented workers that are here because of their status, they're willing to work for less, we have seen a huge erosion of middle class jobs because, uh, you know, the union's wages are always higher and we have better conditions um, and we have benefits that we pay for our, for our employees. Non-union doesn't get any of that or an undocumented worker gets none of that. So let's, let's just say for conversation, our package is $20 an hour, they'll work for 10. So obviously the, our employers then that are assigned to collective bargaining agreements with us are locked into a wage rate. So they can never compete with that guy because they're locked in at a rate. And when they have a, a, a non-union employer, usually it's a non-union employer, who uses an undocumented worker, he's getting that, uh, that same kind of labor for $10 cheaper. The Labor Department issues six unemployment figures each month and labels them U1 through U6. The third, U3, the one we hear on the news each month, measures people without jobs who have actively looked for work within the past four weeks. U6 measures the percentage of the labor force that is unemployed, underemployed, or discouraged. But even that number does not include the true percentage of Americans who could work but choose not to or are forced out by the market. I do think that there is a lot of misinformation that has fed a lot of fear and dehumanization of immigrants, particularly in the current political climate. Um, but the data and the facts show that immigrants contribute and they expand our economic base, which is good for everybody. Some experts believe a better way to understand how immigration impacts our economic base and how many people are long-term unemployed comes from the Bureau of Labor Statistics Current Population Survey. It reveals perhaps an even bigger problem than long-term unemployment. It shows a growing share of adults under age 65 who are out of the labor force altogether. Although the share of those who have joined the workforce has risen somewhat in recent years, it still hasn't returned to the level before the Great Recession. Immigration advocates say there are enough resources in the U.S. budget to train and take care of the long-term unemployed, as well as supporting new immigrants' needs for job training. 
public schooling for their children, and other government benefits for which they qualify. I think it's really important to acknowledge how people feel. And that is a very real narrative. And people feel that pain in their everyday lives. Families are struggling, there's no doubt. And we need to make sure that everyday Americans are taken care of, just like immigrants are taken care of. In that industries, and in those industries in particular, what studies have shown again and again, from George W. Bush's Department of Labor to the New American Economy Reports, which is a bipartisan research and advocacy group, immigrants aren't taking away jobs. They're contributing to the expansion of the economy by first being consumers, by being taxpayers, and by being entrepreneurs. There's an ocean of disagreement on this point between advocates for liberal immigration policies and those fighting for less or no immigration. Dan Stein says the kinds of jobs created by entrepreneurial immigrants may not produce an economy Americans want. A dictator empties out foreign prisons and sends a bunch of criminals here. Well, it creates economic activity because you got to hire more prison guards and social workers and people who manufacture prison equipment. But that isn't necessarily sound economic growth. What you're trying to achieve is not just aggregate GDP. You're trying to achieve per capita GDP. And a lot of people conflate the two and assume that just more people means more consuming and therefore that's better. But in, in, in reality, you're trying to enhance per capita GDP, which can only come about through increasing worker bargaining leverage. Aggregate GDP measures how much the economy produces altogether. Per capita GDP measures how much individuals produce and is a much better gauge of how individuals feel about the economy. While experts also disagree about how many Americans feel secure in the economy, there's a huge divide between them about whether immigration contributes more to economic activity than it takes by, for example, lowering wages in sectors of the economy where jobs don't require advanced degrees. We don't want to harm immigrants any more than anybody else does. Um, we just want a, a fair system so our contractors and our union members that we represent that pay us money to find them good work opportunities have a a leg to stand on because there's just no way. Everything is done by low bid uh, when you bid construction projects. There is no way our contractors can compete when there's a there's no bottom to wages. And that's where contractors cheat the most on wages. So if they can get a, a, a body for $10 when we're charging $20, um, there's no way uh, the middle class job will slowly be eroded. And that's what we were getting at with the you verified piece. Often, yes, immigrants, newly arrived immigrants, refugees, for example, will take lower skilled and lower paying jobs. The meatpacking industry is a prime example. Many people who live in this country already prefer not to have those jobs because they're more dangerous because they're manual labor. But there's another view that says there's just about no job Americans won't do as long as it pays a living wage. And there's a lively debate about whether legal immigration one million people per year and illegal immigration combined to lower wages for jobs that used to pay well. The Los Angeles Times published an article in 2017 with the headline, quote, immigrants flooded California construction, worker pay sank, end quote. They do uh, because of course they increase the supply of workers uh, that does lower the wages temporarily. Um, but it's not all across the board because one thing that immigrants have in common is that they don't speak English as well as native born uh, Americans. And so it tends to just affect certain types of industries um, such as uh, construction and uh, it doesn't affect other industries such as sales or marketing. The article goes on to say in the span of a few decades, LA area construction went from an industry that was two-thirds white and largely unionized to one that is overwhelmingly Latinx, mostly non-union, and heavily reliant on immigrants, according to a Los Angeles Times review of federal data. American construction workers today make $5 an hour less than they did in the early 1970s after adjusting for inflation. In 1972, construction paid today's equivalent 
of $32 an hour, almost $10 more than the average private sector job. But real wages steadily declined for decades, erasing much of that gap. So uh, a lot of times what will happen is uh, native born workers will go from construction and they'll do, they'll move, have to, because the wages are so low in construction because of the new uh, immigrants, they'll go into other industries. Truck driving, taxi driving, yeah. whatever, other, whatever other industries they yeah. impact. Yeah, construction, uh, driving, especially Uber. Um, housekeeping, about half of the people who work in housekeeping are not native born. Um, so typically industries that uh, English is not a requirement uh, to be successful. And many say this is happening all over the country, not just on the West Coast. I have five states in the District of Columbia, which I carry, which I cover. And um, we have seen a great deal of undocumented workers slowly replacing those that are here legally. Um, and, and, and we as a union, we we're, we're not anti-immigrant in the slightest bit. Actually, we, we are for comprehensive immigration reform, but we have seen um, a huge erosion of middle-class jobs that were construction jobs um, being replaced by those coming here working for less. Some say the same kind of thing is taking place in the healthcare field right now, that healthcare aides, even nursing jobs, are going to people from other countries because they will work for less money. The countervailing view is Americans don't want those jobs, creating a shortage at all ends of the healthcare field. Immigrants don't tend to take jobs away from Americans. They tend to fill sectors that Americans are not filling themselves, sometimes because the wages are too low, but also because sometimes that's not where we have the, um, the desire or the expertise. So for example, in the healthcare sector, um, there's a, a big challenge with um, shortages of not only physicians, um, but also home health aides in America right now. Um, immigrants are about twice as likely as the US born to be physicians and surgeons, as well as um, nurses and home health aides. Um, and many of those folks are working in rural counties. In fact, there are some places where um, a foreign born doctor may be the only um, specialist that someone can find who's in a certain county. Wherever you stand on the cause of long-term unemployment, whether we're talking about workers losing health care or construction jobs, one undeniable truth is people are much more likely to be on the sidelines if they lack a high school degree or barely have one. In late December 2019, the New York Times ran expansive coverage of the impact of immigration raids on chicken processing plants in central Mississippi last summer. This was part of President Trump's effort to remove people in the U.S. illegally from employment here. It reported more than 680 Hispanics were forced out and replaced almost immediately by un- or underemployed African Americans. Why? The wages at more than $11 per hour were better than most other low-skilled occupations in this rural part of the country. But the writer questioned how many would stay in these jobs because they are repetitive and difficult. The United States currently has an enormous surplus of less educated people not working, who are of working age and not disabled, uh, who could conceivably be trained to do this work. Um, so if you needed, a, say, a million people in that field, maybe even two million over the next few decades, right now we have somewhere very roughly like 40 million working age people who don't have a college education not working, who are of working age. It seems reasonable to say, well, why don't we use that pool of people? We all recognize that this large pool of people who are idle, of working age, who aren't working, creates a series of social problems from crime to opioid addiction. Um, pulling some percentage of them back into the labor force um, would be uh, very helpful in dealing with certain social problems. And if we really are short of home health care aides or medical technicians, um, that would seem to be a better solution than bringing in uh, foreign workers. And certainly the Great Recession and the COVID-19 virus threw a lot of longtime workers 
out of the workforce. They couldn't get a job. You know, they lost their job and they couldn't get another one. That's a phenomenon known as structural unemployment. So they couldn't really get back into the labor force. And uh, so they dropped out. And then and at the same time, during the recession, we had the younger generation going into school. So they weren't in the labor force. So the recession had a huge impact on uh, structural unemployment and on the labor force participation rate. And that brings us to our last question. What is the impact of immigration on long-term unemployment? Immigration advocates say none or very little because all immigrants are doing is filling jobs Americans don't want. But advocates for the long-term unemployed say mass immigration is part of what is causing this problem. And it is weakening bargaining power for low-income workers, even causing some of the often talked about increasing income inequality in America. This is the point where businesses have to work much harder to entice, to recruit from people who've been discouraged and people who have just given up. I mean, there are a lot of working age people who are poor, who need work. They haven't looked for a job in maybe years because they're so discouraged. This is the point in the economy when they have a chance, when they're needed, where businesses have to go to work to find them. But certainly people from 55 to 64 do face a lot of ageism. Here's a point where businesses could employ these people, perhaps for, for less than full time. Many of these people would take jobs if they could work 30 hours a week. Maybe they're not up to 40 hours a week anymore. This is where you have to get creative. If you're an employer, get creative. Uh, you see a lot of these uh, fast food uh, places around the country who've discovered that actually you can hire a lot of people in their 70s uh, if give them a, one day a week or two hours a day. They like it. As the immigration levels increased, you saw in inequality begin to increase over time, and you saw the wage rates begin to stagnate. There was enormous and robust wage growth after 1946 up through the 1970s. Wages have been stagnant. Liberals and conservatives agree that mass immigration of less educated workers does contribute to wage inequality. Differences remain over for how long a period of time that is the case. And we've seen real abuses as well of workers that are undocumented that have come to us like because they're, they're getting taken advantage of and they want us to represent them even though they aren't our members. And we will go out and meet with them and we just got a huge back pay for a bunch of workers that were undocumented um, because the contractor has had two sets of books. He had a set of books for his legal people. He had a set of books for his illegal people. And he was paying, when, he, when his workers had to work overtime, he was not paying any taxes on those workers and he was cheating them. He wasn't paying them uh, time and a half on Saturdays and Sundays for all of their time that they were working. And which caused them lose out on thousands of dollars. So we we took this case for them, and we took it to the Department of Labor in Virginia, and uh, we won. And the workers got a huge back pay award, but they won, but they lost because they get this huge back pay award. The employer had to pay back some fines and stuff like that, small fines, but they all got fired. Um, and that's not what we're looking for either. We're looking to bring everybody up, not bring anybody down. So. There's no question that because we've allowed sustained high levels of immigration, we have lost a great opportunity to eliminate income inequality in the, in the United States. Meanwhile, Davis has been freelancing and teaching IT to high schoolers for many years. He has plenty of time before he reaches retirement age, but he's still not sure how he plans to spend that time. It was wide open since 1993. And I had a great career, but right now, I really don't know what to tell young people or even myself right now. And of course, both long and short-term unemployment are rising considerably due to the massive blow to the U.S. economy dealt by the COVID-19 virus. It will be months before we know the complete impact of government orders to shelter in place, to shut down restaurants, all non-essential stores, to limit air travel and hotel usage. 
that to prevent the virus from spreading. Businesses have closed, some forever, and it could easily be years before the economy is back to where it was in late 2019. Thanks for watching this To the Contrary special report on immigration's impact on the long-term unemployed. Please visit our PBS website, tothecontrary.org. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next week. Funding for To the Contrary provided by the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, the Colcom Foundation, and the Charles A. Freoff Foundation. For a transcript or to see an online version of this episode of To the Contrary, please visit our PBS website at pbs.org forward slash to the contrary. PBS.